Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. My email address is sriklpm at gmail.com. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting topic Stroke and Hemiplegia Part 2 The Clinical Features The Rule of 17 and Rule of 4 Stroke and Hemiplegia Pathophysiology Ischemic Stroke as I said earlier in part 1, ischemic stroke is about 85% and hemorrhagic stroke is about 15%. So let's talk about ischemic stroke. Blood supply to part of the brain is decreased leading to dysfunction of brain tissue in that area. Ischemic stroke, they are basically of three types. One is thrombosis, second is embolism, third is because of systemic hypoperfusion what are known as low flow strokes so thrombosis embolism and systemic hypoperfusion the low flow strokes what is thrombosis thrombosis is obstruction of a blood vessel by a blood clot formed locally obstruction of a blood vessel by a blood clot clot forming locally it may be in a large vessel or a small vessel what we call it as a lacunar infarction so thrombosis is obstruction of the blood vessel by a blood clot forming locally the next subcategory is embolism embolism is obstruction due to an embolus from elsewhere in the body it could be in the heart it could be in the internal carotid artery or aortic arch so embolism is obstruction due to an embolus from elsewhere in the body and third subcategory is the systemic hypoperfusion because of the hypotension and hypoperfusion decreased blood supply the low flow strokes which is about five percent they are occasionally seen with severe proximal stenosis and inadequate collaterals challenged by systemic hypotensive episodes systemic hypoperfusion or low flow strokes is because of hypotensive episodes so these characteristically produce watershed infarcts or border zone infarcts so we have principally three arteries the anterior cerebral artery the middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery if there are hypotensive episodes and systemic hypoperfusion, the proximal part of the ACA, the proximal part of the MCA, the proximal part of the PCA gets good blood supply. But because of the hypoperfusion and hypotension, as it goes towards the end of the vessel, distal end of the vessel, blood slowly starts still further slowing down and at the extreme end there may be no flow. So when there is systemic hypoperfusion the proximal part of these three arteries may good blood supply but the distal end may not get good blood supply so when the blood supply between the aca and mca is decreased in the distal end we call that as anterior watershed infarction when there is a decreased blood flow between the mca and pca we call that as posterior watershed infarct so these are known as border zone infarcts so in the anterior watershed infarction that is between the aca anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery basically the proximal parts the shoulder and the hip gets affected so they become very weak so that it affects these proximal muscles so much so that the persons are known as man in barrel syndrome man in barrel syndrome because of the extreme weakness of the proximal parts of the shoulders and the hip muscles when there is a decreased perfusion between the mca and pca a posterior watershed infarction is formed 
and it characteristically results in balance syndrome basically posterior watershed infarct and the posterior area is to do with the occipitoparietal and occipitotemporal connections so it results in balance syndrome optic ataxia oculomotor apraxia and asymaltanognosia asymaltanognosia is an inability to integrate the center of the vision with the periphery of the vision they will miss the forest for the tree when they are look, when they are asked to look at the entirety of the forest they'll be only focusing on the center point tree so they they find it difficult to integrate the center of the vision with the periphery of the vision known as asymaltanognosia which is part of the triad of balance syndrome the other two components being optic ataxia and oculomotor apraxia so systemic hypoperfusion or low flow strokes will cause decreased blood supply so proximal parts get reasonably sufficient blood but as they go towards the distal end blood flow slows slow down further so there will be infarction between ac and pc what we call it as anterior cerebral or anterior watershed infarction or mc and pc what we call it as posterior watershed infarction anterior watershed infarction characteristically produces man in barrel syndrome where the shoulder muscles and the hip muscles are affected and the posterior watershed infarct characteristically produces balance syndrome optic ataxia oculomotor apraxia and asymaltanognosia right this is about the pathophysiology of ischemic stroke now let's see the pathophysiology of hemorrhagic stroke hemorrhagic stroke is because of the bleeding due to rupture of vessels bleeding due to rupture of vessels there are two types of hemorrhagic strokes one the intracerebral hemorrhage which accounts for about 10% second is the subarachnoid hemorrhage which accounts for about 5% intracerebral hemorrhage it is basically bleeding within the brain itself due to either intraparenchyal hemorrhage bleeding within the brain tissue or intra intraventricular hemorrhage bleeding within the brain's ventricular system the intracerebral hemorrhage especially due to hypertension occurs in classically four sites putamen being the commonest putamen pons thalamus and cerebellum so if you find hemorrhage in these four sites putamen pons thalamus or cerebellum it is classic of hypertension they are hypertensive beats they are these sites of hypertensive beat why hypertension affects these particular areas because they are end arteries it results in in aneurysms which are charcot aneurysm which ruptures so if you find hemorrhage in putamen pons thalamus or cerebellum it is a intracerebral hemorrhage due to hypertension subarachnoid hemorrhage which is basically bleeding that occurs outside the brain tissue but within the skull under the arachnoid matter it is either due to trauma or because of the rupture of the very aneurysms right persons who get stroke not all persons who get stroke manifest the same amount of clinical findings or severity it could vary from person to person so what are the disease modifying factors the variability in stroke recovery is influenced by collateral vessels if there are good collaterals between the ac and mca or mca and pca or internal carotid artery and the vertebro basilar system so even when there is a block the other vessels can come and compensate it so if there are good collaterals there will be compensatory blood flow and therefore persons chance of recovery becomes better so variability in stroke recovery is influenced by collateral vessels and blood pressure the good amount of blood pressure even if there is hypoperfusion uh, ischemia when the blood pressure is maintained when the mean arterial blood pressure is maintained so so that the cerebral perfusion is good person's chance of recovery is again better specific site some sites where there are important centers obviously the manifestations will be disastrous and devastating some centers where are where there are not important structures obviously the recovery will be better mechanism of vessel occlusion whether it slowly occludes when it slowly occludes there is a time for collateral formation and other compensatory mechanisms but when the mechanism is fast there is no time for compensatory mechanisms and the manifestations will be devastating so 
though the persons may have the same kind of uh, vessels vessels being affected the prognosis or the outcome may vary the variability in stroke recovery is influenced by first the collateral vessels the good blood supply coming from other areas and then uh, supplying the area which is getting less blood obviously the prognosis is going to be better so collateral vessels blood pressure even if there is ischemia if the mean arterial blood pressure is maintained the cerebral perfusion is going to be increased and the person's chance of recovery is better because cerebral perfusion pressure is mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure so if we increase the mean arterial pressure the cerebral perfusion gets increased and person's recovery chances will become better the specific site and then the mechanism of vessel occlusion if blood flow is restored prior to significant cell death the patient may experience only transient symptoms right another important concept to be understood in stroke is auto regulation so what happens in health what happens in stroke in health there are regulatory mechanisms the regulatory mechanisms maintain a constant blood flow across a wide range of arterial blood pressures to meet the high resting metabolic activity of brain tissue so when the blood pressure is lowered there is a compensatory mechanism in the form of dilatation of the cerebral blood vessels so that the perfusion is maintained on the contrary when the blood pressure is raised the cerebral vessels constrict so that the excessive blood flow is is decreased so this is known as auto regulation regulatory mechanisms maintain a constant blood flow a constant blood flow across a wide range of arterial blood pressures to meet the high resting metabolic activity of brain tissue cerebral blood vessels dilate when the systemic blood pressure is lowered and cerebral vessel blood vessels constrict when the systemic blood pressure is raised but but in stroke this auto regulatory system can be disrupted and therefore brain can get affected yeah now having understood the pathophysiology of ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke now let's see how the patients with stroke present what are the presenting problems and the clinical features clinical features and presenting problems most vascular lesions develop suddenly within a matter of minutes or hours and so it should be considered in the differential diagnosis of patient with any acute neurological presentation yeah how do they present usually they present with unilateral weakness and hemiplegia unilateral weakness and hemiplegia is the classic presentation of stroke the weakness is sudden progresses rapidly and may improve the weakness is of upper motor neuron type the upper motor neuron weakness of the face seventh cranial nerve is often present so for the for example when the right cortex is affected not only is there left hemiplegia because of the corticospinal tract involvement but left side or lower lower part of the left side of the face is also affected and the angle of the mouth is deviated to the right side healthier side because of the seventh nerve involvement the mechanisms i'll be telling in a few minutes from now and you strongly suspect that the person is having corticospinal tract involvement but still you are you are not convinced with the signs there aren't there aren't obvious signs so what are the subtle pyramidal signs the most important is pronator drift corticospinal tract has got a predilection for certain muscles it affects certain muscles for example the extensors and the abductors the supinators and the and the wrist extensors so when we come to the lower limb it is the flexors of the lower limb so basically corticospinal tract affects the extensors abductors and the supinator of the upper limb and therefore in a person to elicit the subtle pyramidal sign we have to check out on the pronator drift ask the person to extend the hand and supinate because the supinator is weak when there's a corticospinal tract lesion the hand will pronate so the moment when we the moment we see the pronation of the hand that indicates that there is a subtle pyramidal weakness so pronator drift is a sign of subtle pyramidal weakness or corticospinal tract involvement the other 
finding being the clumsiness of the finger movements because corticospinal tract is a predilection for certain muscle groups like extensors, abductors, supinators and wrist extensors and the flexors of the lower limb and the distal muscles. So distal muscles usually get affected in a corticospinal tract lesions so they will have clumsiness of the finger movements. Yes, now very important we need to understand why the seventh nerve only is affected in a corticospinal tract lesion and why not other cranial nerves. To understand this we need to under understand this motor homonucleus and bilateral innervation of cranial nerves except seventh. So we need to follow this diagram carefully. We have the right cortex, we have the left side cortex and this is the motor homonucleus. We have the leg area, a small trunk area and a big hand area and a big face area. So what does this indicate? The representation is not according to the quantity. The representation is according to the quality. The more the delicate the movements are, the more the representation is. The more usage we require, the more representation it has. For example, we keep using our fingers for, for eating purpose, mixing purpose, for everything we, for writing purpose. So we use fingers, very important. In fact, one of the features by which man is placed at higher level when compared to the lower animals is the way he uses his fingers, manual dexterity and intelligence. So manual dexterity is so very important in human beings. That's why if you see there's a big area for hand and all the fingers, the thumb, the other fingers, a big area. Whereas the trunk, we hardly use trunk. There's no, no particular, uh, we, we don't use trunk much. So the representation is very small and the leg also the representation is, is of moderate. But if you see the face again, the representation is more because there are a lot of facial expressions. Uh, we use face for all kinds of expressions we eat so we keep using our face and facial muscles a lot because we use face and the hands a lot the representation is more for the face and the hands as compared to the trunk and leg same applies for sensory harmonicus uh, almost so now if you see the fibers of the leg area the hand area and the face area the leg is supplied by the the leg area is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and these areas are supplied with the middle cerebral artery. So these fibers come and condense together in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. These fibers come and condense together in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Then they come, go to the brainstem. Midbrain we have the third and fourth nucleus. Pons we have the five, six, seven, eight nucleus. And medulla oblongata we have the nine, ten, eleven, twelve cranial nerve nucleus. And then at the level of the medulla oblongata. It crosses over to the opposite side and goes to the anterior horn cell. So what is upper motor neuron and what is lower motor neuron? Upper motor neuron is the cortic upper motor neuron has got two components. One the cortico bulbar fibers, the fibers of the coming from the bed cells, fifth layer of the motor got the bed cells, the pyramidal tract coming from the cortex going on to the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei we call it as the cortico bulbar fibers so that is the first component the second component are these fibers going up to the level of the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord what we call as the cortico spinal tract so upper motor neuron anything above the nucleus above the motor part of the cranial nerve nucleus we call it as a cortico bulbar fibers above the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord we call it as a cortico spinal fibers so upper motor neuron there are two components cortico bulbar fibers and cortico spinal fibers likewise lower motor neuron anything below the nucleus is the lower motor neuron below the motor part of the cranial nerves coming as the cranial motor part of the cranial nuclei coming as cranial nerves are lower motor neuron coming from the anterior horn cells as peripheral nerve that is also lower motor neuron so lower motor neuron again has got two components one these cranial nerves the cranial nerves the third nerve fourth nerve sixth nerve these cranial nerves are lower motor neuron likewise the anterior horn cell coming from as peripheral nerve is also lower motor neuron so upper motor neuron there are two components cortico bulbar fibers coming to the cranial motor nuclei 
and corticospinal fibers coming to the anterior haunches of the spinal cord. Lower motor neuron also there are two components. One what comes from the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei as cranial nerves. Second is the what comes from the anterior haunches as the peripheral nerves. Another important point to be noted here is that the peripheral tract or the corticospinal tract is purely a motor tract. It does not do anything with sensory whatsoever. For example, third nerve is motor, fourth nerve is motor. So it goes to the motor, it goes to the third nerve nucleus, fourth nerve nucleus. Whereas when we come to the fifth nerve nucleus, it has got motor part and sensory part. It does not go to the sensory part, it goes only to the motor part. It goes to the sixth, seventh, but it does not go to the eighth nerve because eighth nerve is a sensory part. So corticospinal tract is concerned with only the movements, motor part. It has got nothing to do with sensory whatsoever. So that's again a very, very important point. So if you see the cranial nerve nucleus, the third and fourth cranial nerves are in the midbrain. 5, 6, 7, 8 are in the pons. 9, 10, 11, 12 are in the medulla oblongata. Right. Now, there are so many tracts and so many cranial nerves in the brain stem. It is very difficult to remember these tracts and the cranial nerves. But if we know one rule, which is known as rule of four, we can know almost all the structures which are present in the brain stem. Very fascinating rule, rule of four, by which we can remember almost all the structures and the cranial nerves, how they are present also. So what is this rule of four? According to rule of four, there are four cranial nerves in medulla oblongata, there are four cranial nerves in pons and four cranial nerves in midbrain and above. So the four cranial nerves in midbrain and above, so above it is one, two and in the midbrain we have the three, four. Four cranial nerves in the pons, five, six, seven, eight. Four cranial nerves in the medulla oblongata, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we have four cranial nerves in medulla oblongata, four cranial nerves in pons, four cranial nerves in midbrain and above. Fine. Now we know that the third, fourth is in the midbrain, five, six, seven, eight is in the pons, nine, ten, eleven, twelve is in the medulla oblongata. Now we need to know whether they are placed, what cranial nerves are placed medially, what cranial nerves are placed laterally. The cranial nerves which are divisible by 12 or which which divides 12 into equal parts are placed medially. The cranial nerves which cannot divide 12 into equal parts are placed laterally. So let us go step by step. We have third nerve and fourth cranial nerves in the midbrain. Three can divide 12 into four parts. 12 by 3 is 4. 4 can divide 12 into three parts. 12 by 4 is 3. So, a third and fourth cranial nerves are therefore placed medially. When we come to the 5, 6, 7, 8 cranial nerves in the pons, 5 cannot divide 12 into equal parts, so 5 is placed laterally. 6 can divide 12 into two equal parts, so 6 is placed medially. 7 cannot divide 12 into equal parts, so it is placed sideways laterally. Again, 8 cannot divide 12 into equal parts, so 8 is placed laterally. So, in pons, 5, 7 and 8 are placed in the lateral part of the brainstem whereas 6 is placed in the medial part of the brainstem that is pons. Medulla oblongata, 9, 10, 11, 12 cranial nerves. 9 cannot divide 12 into equal parts, 10 cannot divide 12 into equal parts, 11 cannot divide 12 into equal parts but 12 can divide 12 into one equal part. So 9, 10, 11 cranial nerves are placed laterally sideways, 12th cranial nerve is placed medially. So to summarizing all, all these uh, findings we have just told, 3 and 4 are in the midbrain medially, 6 is in the pons medially, 12 is in the medulla oblongata medially. So 3, 4, 6, 12 are placed medially whereas rest of the cranial nerves are placed laterally. So, 4 cranial nerves in the medulla oblongata 9, 10, 11, 12, 4 in the pons 5, 6, 7, 8 and 2 in the midbrain 3, 4 and 2 above 1 and 2. So, cranial nerves we have understood. Now, let us talk about the tracks. We have sensory tracks, we have the motor tracks. We have so many tracks, how to remember? 
again easy to remember again rule of four four tracks which start with the letter m are placed medially m for m four tracks which start with the letter s are placed sideways so four tracks which start with the letter m are placed medially m for m four tracks which start with the letter s are placed sideways s for s so what are the tracks which start with the letter m which are placed medially first is the motor tract that is the corticospinal tract that is the pyramidal tract so corticospinal tract pyramidal tract that is motor tract is placed medially m for m then we have the medial lemniscus the posterior column which is also placed medially medial longitudinal fasciculus mlf which connects the third nerve fourth nerve sixth nerve with eighth nerve mlf it starts with the letter m that is also placed medially and motor part of the cranial nerves are placed medially so all m's are placed medially m for m motor part of the cranial nerves motor tract that is the corticospinal tract medial longitudinal fasciculus and medial lemniscus posterior column that's why in medial medullary syndrome the 12th nerve posterior column and the permanent tract gets affected because they are medially placed so m for m we have seen four structures with the letter m which are placed medially now four structures which start with the letter s which are placed sideways are one sensory part of the cranial nerves especially the trigeminal nerve spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve the spinothalamic tract which carries pain and temperature sense the sympathetic system which is responsible for the dilatation of the pupil and then finally the spinocerebellar tracts so 4s are placed sideways so four structures which start with the letter s are placed sideways the sensory part of the cranial nerves the trigeminal nerve especially the spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve the spinothalamic tract the sympathetic tract and the spinocerebellar fibers that's why in the lateral medullary syndrome these structures which are placed laterally or sideways are affected that is the spinothalamic tract therefore the pain and temperature sense is lost on the opposite side the trigeminal the spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve the sensory part therefore they have the ipsilateral facial sensory loss they have the sympathetic system being affected so horner syndrome unilateral horner syndrome uh, pupil is myotic pupil and spinocerebellar fibers getting affected very important the lateral medullary syndrome commonly known as wallenberg syndrome does not produce hemiplegia the lateral medullary syndrome or wallenberg syndrome does not produce hemiplegia very important in fact one of the common findings is vertigo why they don't produce hemiplegia hemiplegia is because of the corticospinal tract lesion but where is the corticospinal tract is placed it is placed medially whereas the wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome is the tract which is placed which is placed on the sideways where we don't have corticospinal tract so very important all these manifestations so we know that 3 4 are in the midbrain 5 6 7 8 are in the pons 9 10 11 12 in the medulla oblongata now the question comes why when there is a lesion on one side for example right side we have left hemiplegia but none of the cranials get affected except seventh why only seventh cranial nerve gets affected why not other cranial nerves other cranial nerves don't get affected if you see this diagram these cranial nerves get supplied not only from the corticospinal fibers and corticobulbar fibers permal tract from one side but it also gets supplied from the opposite side so the cranial nerves get supplied not only from one side ipsilateral side but also from contralateral side and therefore if there's a lesion here the cranial nerves should get affected but they don't get affected because they get supplied from the opposite side so when there's a lesion here they have only hemiplegia on the opposite side because the corticospinal tract crosses over and grows to the opposite side so they have hemiplegia on the opposite side but the seventh cranial nerve in the pons only gets affected why only the seventh cranial nerve in the pons gets affected why only the seventh cranial nerve in the pons gets affected now the seventh cranial nerve nucleus in the pons i have enlarged this is the seventh cranial nerve nucleus in the pons seventh cranial nerve nucleus in the pons has got upper part and lower part the right side as well on the left side upper part and the lower part the upper part supplies the upper part of the face 
and the lower part supplies the lower part of the face. Like all other cranial nerves, the upper part gets bilateral innervation, the corticobulbar fibers on the same side as well as the corticobulbar fibers on the opposite side. So if you say, if you if we take the left upper part of the facial nerve nucleus also, it gets from the same side as well as from the opposite side. But the catch is the lower part. The lower part gets supplied only from the opposite side. This lower part gets supplied only from the opposite side. That's the catch. The lower part does not get bilateral innervation. It gets supplied only from the opposite side. That's very important. Now let's see what happens in a UMN lesion and an LMN lesion. UMN lesion commonly the stroke. So anything above the nucleus is the UMN. Anything below the nucleus is LMN. The commonest LMN lesion is Bell's palsy. Facial now. So if there's a lesion above the nucleus, what happens? This fiber gets affected, but this is compensated from the opposite side. This fiber is affected. Again, this is compensated from the opposite side. This fiber is affected and there is no compensation and therefore in a right UMN lesion left ho lower half of the facial nerve nucleus gets affected left lower half supplies the lower part of the face and therefore in a right UMN facial palsy left lower half gets affected so in a right UMN lesion left lower half gets affected angle of the mouth deviates towards the opposite side whereas if it's an LMN lesion both the upper part the final pathway is gone though both the upper part and the lower part on the same side gets affected so in an lmn lesion upper part and the lower part on the same side gets affected so entire half gets affected in an lmn lesion on the same side whereas an umn lesion only the side opposite gets affected and that to the lower part so in an lmn lesion the entire half of the face gets affected upper part as the lower part so they cannot close the eyelids so when we ask them to close the eyelids, you can see the eyeball moving upwards. This is known as Bell's phenomenon. Bell's phenomenon is a normal phenomenon seen in persons with Bell's palsy. Any person who attempts to close the eyelids, the eyeball moves upwards. But we cannot see it in normal persons because they have closed the eyelids. So we cannot see the eyeballs moving upwards. But in persons with Bell's palsy, where there is, where there is eyelid weakness, they cannot close the eyelid. But the moment they attempt to close the eyes, their reflex comes into force and you can see the eyeball moving upwards. So Bell's phenomenon is a normal phenomenon seen in persons with Bell's palsy. So right human lower half, lower half of the left face is affected, right element upper part and the lower part of the right face is affected. Now, now we need to talk about an important rule, rule of 17 very easy to remember because seventh now gets affected tenth now gets affected there will be movement fifth now gets affected twelfth now gets affected there will be movement so how to remember we can remember it by an easy rule known as rule of 17 12 plus 5 this is not 3 this is 5 12 plus 5 is 17 and 10 plus 7 is also 17 so if tenth now and seventh now gets affected seventh now gets affected or 10th nerve, you know, the palate gets affected, the movement will be towards the healthier side. Whereas if 12th nerve know, and 5th nerve, you know, if they get affected, the movement will be towards the disease side. 12th nerve you know, is genioglossus tongue. 10th and plus, the movement will be towards the healthier side. And 12 plus 5, the movement will be towards the disease side. Very, very important. So we have seen rule of 17. We have seen the rule of 4. So I told that there is an upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. Upper motor neuron, there are two components, corticobulbar fibers, corticospinal fibers. Lower motor neuron, again, there are two components, cranial nerves and the peripheral nerves. So how do we differentiate between an upper motor neuron lesion and a lower motor neuron lesion? Upper motor neuron lesion, generally, the muscles maintain the normal bulk. They are normal. There is not wasting. Even if there is wasting, it may be a, a disuse wasting. But usually, the there is no wasting. The bulk is normal. But in in lower motor neuron lesion, anterior horns, there is a severe wasting. The severe muscle wasting. They become very thin, and they throw twitches of the muscles, which is known as fasciculation. Fasciculation is involuntary muscle contraction, muscle fiber contractions. They are known as fasciculations. It is because of Cannon's law of denervation supersensitivity. 
the anterior horn cells when they are partially affected so when the anterior horn cells are partially affected they become super sensitive to acetylcholine and they start reacting to acetylcholine even when it is just found in the vicinity and starts contracting spontaneously contracting this is known as Kenon's law of denervation super sensitivity so we see in lower motor neuron lesions anti horn cells where they have a spontaneous muscle fiber twitching which is known as fasciculations so wasting and fasciculations are suggestive of lower motor neuron lesions the tone in upper motor neuron corticospinal tract lesions it has got a proclivity for flexors of the upper limb and the extensors of the lower limb so when the flexors of the upper limb gets affected the tone gets increased they flex their upper limbs when the extensors of the lower limb the tone is increased they extend the lower limbs so they flex the upper limbs they extend the lower limbs this is a characteristic circumduction gait we we see in so many stroke patients the circumduction gait when they walk we can easily identify it they flex the upper limbs because corticospinal tract increases the tone in flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb since they cannot since the extensor the tone is increased they cannot clear the ground so they have to encircle the lower limb and then walk like this this is the classic circumduction gait we see in persons suffering from hemiplegia because of spasticity increase in flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb tone and obviously there will be increased increased reflexes and the tone will be also spastic in type that is tone is the resistance offered by muscles to passive movements the tone is spastic in upper motor neuron lesion whereas it is it is decreased in the lower motor neuron lesions again the increased high increased tone could be spastic or rigid spasticity is seen in the corticospinal tract lesions spinal tract lesions where the initially it will be di difficult to overcome then it becomes easier to overcome so initially it will be difficult to overcome but then it becomes easier to overcome spastic otherwise known as clasp nice spasticity characteristically seen in permal tract lesions whereas in extra permal lesions it affects all groups of muscles equally the tone is increased in all groups of muscles equally and it is led by rigidity the tone is equal throughout the resistance offered by muscles is equal throughout like a lead pipe so it is known as lead pipe rigidity if there are superimposed tremors we call that as cogwheel rigidity we classically seen in parkinson's disease where the tone is decreased in lower motor neuron lesions the pattern of weakness very important as i said it preferentially affects the extensors in the arm abductors and the flexors in the limb lower limb so it affects the extensors abductors and the supinator that's why we have the classic pronator drift since the supinator becomes weak in a corticospinal tract lesions when we ask them to extend the hand since the supinator becomes weak the pronator takes over so there is a pronator drift so pronator drift is very classic of this and it is known as a subtle sign of the corticospinal tract lesions so pattern of weakness it affects the groups of muscles the extensors of the upper limbs and the flexors of the lower limb whereas in a lower motor neuron lesions it is typically focal in distribution of nerve root or peripheral nerve with associated sensory changes for example c5 affects biceps infraspinatus rhomboids deltoid and supraspinatus so it affects the selective muscles here the muscle groups are affected in the um lesions in lmn lesions individual muscles supplied by the particular root or the nerve are affected the deep tendon reflexes are increased in upper motor neuron lesions they are decreased in lower motor neuron lesions and plantar response by and by and large this is the most important uh, sign one of the most important signs in clinical neurology it is extensor plantar response babinski sign in upper motor neuron when we come from the lateral side and and go towards the big toe the big toe goes up l5 and the other toe goes for fanning of the toes so big toe going up the fanning of the other toes very classic of upper motor neuron lesion known as babinski sign whereas in a lower motor neuron lesion it is flexor in type yeah this is about motor so the clinical features and presenting problems is mainly hemiplegia the weakness on one side unilateral weakness we have other clinical presentations also unilateral sensory disturbances especially in the parietal lobe supplied by the mca gets affected we have visual disturbances homonymous hemianopia 
because the visual radiations go very close to the antennae uh, internal capsule and then we have the optic radiations in the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe so if the parietal lobe gets affected we have the inferior quadrantonopia if the temporal lobe gets affected we have the superior quadrantonopia so another important presentation is amaurosis fugax transient monocular blindness is a particular form of TIA, transient ischemic attack due to retinal ischemia. Patients describe a shade descending over the visual field and ipsilateral carotid artery is often implicated. Ipsilateral carotid artery gives rise to ophthalmic artery when the ophthalmic artery is involved. So person's vision gets affected, amaurosis fugax describe a shade descending over the visual field and then we have to suspect that the person is having internal carotid artery stenosis it's a warning sign tia transient ischemic attack we have to evaluate and immediately start him on uh, antiplatelets uh, therapy so amaurosis fugax then speech disturbances may be there dysphasia indicating damage to the frontal lobe or parietal lobe a uh, very important concept we need to understand here is the dominant cortex and the non-dominant cortex almost all the persons who are right-handed 90 percent of the right-handed persons the speech centers are situated on the left side we call that as a dominant cortex 10 percent may have it on the right side and for left hand still most of the time more than 60 percent of the time speech centers are situated on the left side and, and 40 percent may have it on the right side so dominant cortex is that cortex where the speech centers are situated so for more, almost all the right handers it is on the left and for most of the left handers it is still left so when there's when there's an infarct in the left mca the superior division affects the broca's area and persons may have broca's aphasia the inferior division may affect the vernix area and may present with vernix aphasia so speech basically there are three components we understand the speech comprehension which goes to the vernix area it then transfer it then transmits the information from the vernix area to the broca's area through arcuate fasciculus which is concerned with the repetition and broca's area is for fluency so the vernix area gets affected person's comprehension is lost he cannot understand since broca's area is intact he keeps on talking so it's it's a fluent but nonsense speech if broca's area gets affected since the vernix area is intact, he can understand, but since Broca's area is affected, he cannot speak. So it's a sensible but non-fluent and telegraphic speech. And if arcuate fasciculus gets affected, repetition is affected, so they develop conduction aphasia. The vernix area is supplied by the inferior division of the middle cerebral artery. The Broca's area is supplied by the superior division of the middle cerebral artery. So if an embolus lodges into the inferior division of the middle cerebral artery, person will develop vernix aphasia. If an embolus lodges into the superior division of the MCA, persons will develop Broca's aphasia. And if the stem of the MCA is involved, Broca's and Wernicke's both are affected, results in global aphasia. So speech disturbances and dysphasia indicate damage to the frontal or parietal lobe. Then there could be dysarthria. Again, there are basically three components. When we speak, we use either the lips, the tongue and the palate. If the lips are affected, we call it as a labial component being affected. The lips are supplied by the seventh nerve orbicularis oculi orbicularis oris and therefore if the seventh nerve gets affected they cannot use the lip well so the labial component gets affected for example they cannot uh, pronounce the word pa for pa we have to use lips so when you ask them to say pa since they cannot close their lips because orbicularis oris is affected because of the seventh nerve they cannot say pa then the lingual component twelfth nerve tha for saying tha we have to use tongue if 12th nerve is affected they cannot use the tongue so they cannot say they cannot pronounce the letters which need the usage of tongue so for example tha they cannot say tha the lingual component gets affected palate is supplied by the 10th nerve so if 10th nerve gets affected palate gets affected they cannot say the pronounced letters where we need to use palate like ka ka so ask a person to say pa tha ka if a person is not able to say pa, that means the labial component lips are affected, seventh nerve is affected. If a person is not able to say tha, pronounce tha well, that means the twelfth nerve is affected, the lingual component is affected. Ka, if he is not able to say the palate is affected, the tenth nerve is affected. So pa, tha, ka, we can find out which of these cranial nerves are involved. Dysarthria. Then brainstem signs. Ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia. As we have seen in the diagram, the third and fourth nerves are in the midbrain, 
5, 6, 7, 8 are in the pons and 9, 10, 11, 12 are in the medial oblongata. So if third and fourth are involved and hemiplegia is on the opposite side, it is a midbrain lesion. If 5, 6, 7, 8 are involved on the same side and hemiplegia is on the opposite side, it is a pontine lesion. If 9, 10, 11, 12 cranial nerves are involved on, the, on one side and hemiplegia is on the opposite side, that means it is a, a medulla oblongata lesion and then the cerebellum gets affected, person will have ataxia. So the symptom pr presentation reflects the particular vascular territory which is involved. For example, MCA means they will have aphasia. Uh, medulla oblongata is supplied by the vertebral artery, so if the vertebral artery is involved, medulla oblongata gets affected, so they can have Wallenberg syndrome. If basilar artery gets affected, pons gets affected, so have they have pontine manifestations. If posterior cerebral artery gets affected, midbrain gets affected, like as posterior cerebral artery gets affected, occipital cortex gets affected, so they will have symptoms pertaining to the midbrain and the occipital cortex. And MCA gets affected, the entire cortex gets affected, they will have speech, they will have the conjugate gaze palsy. And they can have homonymous hemianopia. If the anterior cerebral artery gets affected, they have the leg area being affected. They can have paraparesis. So it depends. The symptoms reflect the vascular territory involved. Yeah, uh, this is the book I wrote, Focus Neurology. I'm the medical author of this book. Uh, uh, most of the neurology points I put it in a question answer form. So this is all about the clinical presentation of stroke, the pathophysiology, especially the rule of four and rule of 17, which are very, very important. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my webpage, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.